Hi, my name is Amy Elias. I'm the director of the UT Humanities Center, and I'm really uh, just thrilled to welcome you to our Distinguished Visiting Speakers Series today. We have a wonderful guest in Pamela Gib Gilbert, whom, um, who I will let uh, our guest faculty host introduce in a moment, uh, Nancy Henry from the Department of English. Um, but in the meantime, I'd say thanks for coming to this series. We have a number of interesting speakers still to go in our semester. It's been a wonderful semester for speakers. The next speaker will be Andrew Curran, William Armstrong Professor of the Humanities at Wesleyan University. He'll be speaking on March 29th in the same sort of webinar format. And he'll be talking about the Bordeaux Academy of Sciences and their definitions of race in 1741 and the implications of that for 18th century studies. So I hope you can join us uh, for all of our wonderful lectures. Um, so I am going to turn it over uh, to Nancy Henry from the UT Department of English, who will introduce our guest speaker. Nancy. Welcome, everyone. I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Professor Pamela Gilbert. Her visit to UT last spring was one of the first events of the pandemic to be canceled. While we were, of course, hoping to reschedule her visit to Knoxville, this virtual event has the advantage of allowing us to welcome audience members from around the country, as well as members of the UT community. Pamela Gilbert is the Albert Brick Professor of English at the University of Florida. She has distinguished herself as a scholar of 19th century literature and culture through her focus on the history of the body and medicine, as well as through her interest in genre, especially Victorian women's literature, popular literature, and the realist novel. She has published widely in the field and edited numerous collections, including the invaluable four volume encyclopedia of Victorian literature in 2015 with Dino Faluga and Linda Hughes. Her books reflect her consistent interest in the history of the body and medical humanities. These include Disease Desire in the Body in Victorian Women's Popular Novels in 1997, Mapping the Victorian Social Body in 2004, The Citizen's Body, Desire, Health, and the, and the Social in Victorian England in 2007, and Cholera and the Nation, Doctoring the Social Body in Victorian England in 2008. Her most recent book, Victorian Skin, Surface Self History, supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship and published by Cornell University Press in 2019, explores the many ways Victorians thought and wrote about skin, not just as an external covering for something internal and essential, but as a surface to be interpreted and as an inseparable part of individual and collective identities. Drawing on science, philosophy, and literature, her work as a whole has particular resonance today through its exploration of cholera epidemics, skin color and race, and the tattoos that have become so expressive of identity in our own culture. Her talk today is Those Mysterious Markings, Tattoos, Identity, and the British Traveler. Please welcome Pamela Gilbert. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, I am so happy to be here. I wanna thank Nancy for um, organizing this and um, I'm excited to be hosted by the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And I am really sorry that I can't be there in person, but hopefully that will happen at some point in the future. So today I am giving a paper which is out of the, um, one of the final chapters of my book. And I wanna place tattooing in British culture in the 19th century. Um, and we can move to um, the first slide. Um, so over the course of the century, there are three principal associations with tattooing. Um, the first is its relation to exotic travel. Thank you. The second association is with the establishment of identity, and that identity is in question. And with that brings up also the question of like, who can uh, interpret identity, who can read tattoos with authority. And the third and final meaning is an ambiguous association with aristocratic privilege and cosmopolitanism that uh, emerges in the late century that comes to evoke an atavistic anti-modern untrustworthiness. So I'm gonna to proceed today in three sections. One's gonna be kind of broadly on history. One will be on identity and interpretation. We'll talk a little bit about a couple of stories. And finally, um, 
a more extended reading of cosmopolitan atavism in a novel by Thomas Hardy. So first of all, history. Tattooing has a really ancient history. It was long known in the biblical world and is forbidden to Jews in Leviticus. Um, so the European Otzi, and, and thanks, get that to that first slide, you'll see Otzi's hand. Uh, he died in 3250 BCE, he had 61 tattoos. Um, and he was, you know, he died in Europe and this was, uh, these were obviously European tattoos. But then tattooing was banned by Pope Hadrian in 487 as a quote, heathen practice. And it appears not to have been widely known in Western Europe again until the modern period. Uh, next slide. Uh, in the late 17th century, explorations in the New World and the South Seas brought knowledge of the extensively tattooed people there. And Captain James Cook in 1774 brought back a guest, and I'm using this term because supposedly it was at his own expressed wish, but who knows what the status of agency was. Um, this person was named Omai uh, from Tahiti, who displayed his tattoos at court and was painted by Joshua Reynolds, as you see here. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a close up of his hands with the tattoos. And that brought tattooing uh, again to the forefront of the broader public's attention in Britain. By the 19th century, tattoos are widely known in the UK, um, most associated with sailors and used in part, it is said, to help identify bodies lost at sea. Uh, bodies that might be lost at sea. Um, detailed descriptions of Malay and Indian and Native American tattooing practices were widely distributed in anthropological literature. Darwin follows the custom of many naturalists when he discusses tattooing as an enhancement of sexual attractiveness in various cultures. Slaves were also tattooed and branded uh, in many European colonies and in the United States. And tattooing was widely used in India by natives, uh, both in traditional ways, and also to stigmatize and identify criminals. After 1797, Claire Anderson notes, convicts in Bengal had their name, crime, date of sentence, and court tattooed on the forehead. Although by the mid-Victorian period, Britons denounced such practices as cruel in the colonies, branding was actually recently abolished in Britain at that point. American traveler Joseph Ballard observes that in Chester in 1815, he observes a, a branding, uh, a marking of, a, of a, you know, a symbol on um, the skin of the hand and that there was an iron affixed for that purpose uh, just outside the court. In Britain, tattooing was general not only among the maritime, but the general working classes, criminals, of course, and perhaps more surprisingly among schoolboys of good background who learned of the practice from reading adventure novels and tales of the sea. Preparations of tattooed skin were very common in anatomical museums by the mid-century. The next slide will show you one um, from, whoops, uh, maybe go one more, one more forward. There we go. Um, and this one um, is from the Welcome Collection. Um, this particular tattoo is probably from a French uh, subject. Um, and these were cataloged by my good friend Gemma Angel as part of her uh, dissertation working on that collection. Um, tattooing in continental Europe was mostly associated with the military working in criminal classes. Cesare Lombroso observes that 10% of criminals he has examined were tattooed versus 1.2% of soldiers. Uh, he notes even higher proportions elsewhere in the US, for example, at Elmira prison, 34% of the inmates were tattooed. And in Berlin at another prison, 25%. But it was not just at the century's end that tattooing was prevalent. And I think we can go back to the Ellis quote now that I had out of order, if you flip back on the slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, the forensic specialist Kestevin writing in 1855, cite studies done in France and Germany, um, 37 individuals at one hospital, a different researcher in Paris, found uh, 506 out of 3,000. Um, and these were largely military uh, invalids at the hospital, were found to present tattoo marks, um, mostly on the arm, uh, on the hands, uh, and then fewer on the chest, thighs, buttocks, and of course, one on the anus. Uh, Johann Kasper in 1861 gives many examples of ordinary people with tattoos. If you go to the next slide, you'll see some of those. Uh, Whoops, ah, my, top, my slides are out of order. Go a little further down. There we go. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Nope, up, back up. <laughs> there we go. All right, thank you very much. Um, sorry, these are out of order. So um, by the end of the century, Giordana Belkin shows that the tattoo could also function in a kind of new way in Britain as an emblem of cultural elitism rather than criminality. Uh, she shows that tattoo artists of London were lionized in society journals and catered to wealthy clients in lavish Orientalist studios. Several magazine articles cover the fashion and even allowing for exaggeration, it's pretty clear that it was in fact prevalent. Uh, Harmsworth magazine writer R.J. Stevens writes, when royalty hangs on to a craze, you may be assured that the rest of the exclusive world of wealth and power soon follow. Grand Duke Alexei of Russia is most elaborately tattooed. He also lists several other European royals, including the Duke of York, and remarks that, quote, ladies have taken a strong liking to this form of decoration. And that comes up a lot. Um, Bilkin notes that the trend was generally thought to be sparked by Edward VII, who accepted the customary tattoo marking a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and his son, George V, who was tattooed by a famous Japanese artist while visiting that country. And that is that emerges in a lot of the literature, right, right around the end of the century. Japanese tattoos were crazed. There were very famous, well-respected artists, and it was a real prestige um, piece of artwork to visit one of these particular artists and, and get the tattoo. And of course, there were lots of people tattooing in the style of that you could you could go and see in London um, and pretend that you had been to Japan. <laughs> um, but the content of the privileged classes tattoos also tended to reflect their status more directly. Belkin notes that they quote ordered their own coats of arms tattooed upon their skin or the names and emblems of their exclusive clubs or scenes of fox hunts in full cry. Tattooing was also often used by less elite classes to memorialize important occasions or journeys. Stevens marks, remarks that colonials who visited England, quote, usually returned bearing on some part of their body an emblem of some national importance, such as a picture of Victoria or the flag. People had reproductions of favorite paintings. Stevens mentions a couple by Landseer and Reynolds. Tattoos could also be done for beauty or to fix scars. Tattoo artist George Burchette recalls permanently tattooing lips and cheeks for color and eyebrows for color and shape. According to his memoirs, this was done long before the First World War. Additionally, he did fix many war scars and covered the disfiguration of inadvertent gunpowder tattoos with an opaque flesh-colored tattoo compounded unfortunately, of white lead. Although journalists such as Stevens wrote gossipy, approving columns on this craze, others were less accepting. Bailkin observes that, quote, the notion that tattooed women marked out a distinctively British problem of decline was echoed in texts on metropolitan tattooing before and after the Great War. Cesare Lombroso wrote in 1896 that the attraction to tattoos was evidence of savage and criminal tendencies, quote, the chief cause that has spread this custom among us is, in my opinion, atavism, or that other kind of historical atavism that is called tradition. Tattooing is, in fact, one of the essential characteristics of primitive man and of men who live still in the savage state. Women, Lombroso felt, were already closer to the savages than men, but English women were even worse. He says, I have been told the fashion of tattooing the arm exists among women of prominence in London society. The taste for this style is not a good indication of the refinement and delicacy of English ladies. First, it indicates an inferior sensitiveness, for one has to be obtuse to pain to submit to this wholly savage operation. And second, it is contrary to progress, for all exaggerations of dress are atavistic. Now, Havelock Ellis continued Lombroso's work in the British context. Um, and I don't know which slide this is. Try going forward. No, nope, maybe backward. A little more. There we, there we go. Well, yes, there we go. Thank you very much. So, um, you know, he, he uh, suggests that um, maybe rather than atavism, it should be described as a survival. And, um, you know, this more kind of accepting uh, vision of tattoos is probably related to the fact that tattoos were so widespread among Britons. Um, even for Ellis, though, tattooing is a practice that persists from a more primitive period before abstract linguistic representation. By both Lombroso and Ellis, tattoos are seen as fundamentally communicative in nature 
and any aesthetic moment, motive is subordinated to purposes of signification. The topic of that signification was most often taken to be for granted to be the self of the bearer. So I want to talk now about that self, that identity, and um, its and, and anxieties about identity. Tattoos were functional as well as expressive. They permanently marked the body as distinct and unique. This was part of its appeal to clients, but also to criminologists. There are the usual stories of people tattooing names of lovers and then needing to change them. Lots of you know com comedy around that. But its permanence also made it attractive to those who wish to memorialize a commitment other than a romantic one, and to make that commitment impossible to deny, which may have had as much attractiveness to criminal groups like the Camorra, which Lombroso studied, as any notion of self-expression. In Collins's Women in White, for example, 1861 novel, the secret revolutionary society in Italy to which Pesca belongs and to which Fosco is a traitor, marks its members with, quote, a, a brand deeply burnt in the flesh and stained of a bright red color. When a traitor is executed, the mark is effaced by incising a T for traitor, not tattoo, in the flesh, thus making its link to the brotherhood impossible for outsiders to read, but still insisting on a truth about the identity of the body bearing it, a different truth, a new truth. The consistent connection of tattoos to stories of false identity seems to have been set in Britain as a result of the Tishborn case. And just let me briefly summarize that for you. Um, and there is a slide with three pictures on it. I don't know which one it is, but that's Tishborn. You might want to throw that up there. There we go. Thank you. Um, briefly, a butcher by the name of Arthur Orton from Wagga Wagga, Australia, came to London in 1866, claiming to be Sir Roger Tichborne, the long lost heir of a very substantial fortune and family name. Now, Roger was born in 1829. He was a, a slight man who'd been raised in France. He was lost at sea in 1854. He had light brown hair. His first language was French, French accent. Arthur was not a slight man and he had dark hair and he didn't speak any French. But Roger's bereaved mother accepted him as, uh, as the claimant to the fortune and society def deferred to her. Then Lady Tishborn died in 1868 and the surviving family soon after did challenge his legitimacy. And so a trial to establish his identity took place over several months in 1871 and 1872. One thing that undermined his claim was the fact that, Ro that Roger Orton didn't have any tattoos. Whereas Roger Tichborn had at the age of 16 both tattooed and been tattooed by the future Lord Ballou, quote, a schoolfellow of Rogers who deposed that in 1847 to eight, in that school year, he saw the cross, heart, and anchor on Roger's arm, and that he himself tattooed the letters RCT in addition to those symbols. Roger tattooed Lord Ballou's arm the same day. Orton, however, still had many often working class supporters who believed he'd been done out of his rights. And so the story was widely fictionalized and tattoos moved to, moved to the fore as plot devices to establish identity. The story continued to be important as evidence of the ways that scars and tattoos were more reliable uh, than, other source, than other measures of identity. One way in which Orton's supporters tried to prove he was Sir, with, he was Sir Roger was with photographic evidence. And you see here um, where they've superimposed it so that they can show that actually there are these similarities. Um, and you can judge for yourself whether that is persuasive. <laughs> um, the width of the eyes, the proportion of the jaw, et cetera. And Rowan McWilliam has an excellent book on this where he discusses this at length. The photos were decided to be inconclusive in part because there was a kind of celebrated uh, discussion of the recent use of altered photographs in France. After the trial, though, the card continued to be circulated in an unsuccessful attempt to support the claimant's assertions of innocence after the judgment. These examples highlight both the weight some gave to photography as objective evidence to prove identity and a simultaneous critique of its inadequacies, as well as canny suspicions of photographic alteration. And that'll become important again later. A tattoo, on the other hand, might be altered by another tattoo or other scar, but it couldn't simply be erased. Even the alteration would leave marks suggesting the presence of the original tattoo. And there was endless discussion about whether tattoos could be removed in this period and expert testimony and so forth, so on and so forth. Methods of identification became increasingly important to criminology, visual identification in the second half of the century. Photography and forensic medicine were drawn into anthropometric discourses around criminology, and so was the tattoo. 
A good place to see this is in the sort of major forensic medicine textbook, as it were, of the period, Alfred Swain Taylor's Manual of Medical Jurisprudence, which went through 13 editions in the 19th century. The first 1836 edition, nothing on tattoos or scars. In 1866, the eighth edition, some scars, but no tattoos. By the 10th edition of 1879, detailed section on tattoos and scars and lots on the Tishborn case. And that really continues through the end of the century. Um, so uh, in 1891, he says, well, you know, tattoos may sometimes be cauterized off, but an expert can find the traces. And indeed, the permanence of tattoos were an important area of inquiry in forensic medicine from the mid-century onward. Whatever the status of the actual history of tattooed Europeans or of Britain's own many domestically acquired tattoos, British literature imagines the tattoo is connected to both the experiences of visiting savage peoples, especially in the East, and of being absent from England. The skin marking was the outward sign of an inner transformation that could be contaminating, enriching, or both. Still, even though coming from without, the tattoo was nevertheless held to be a true and permanent sign of inward identity. And as such, they became a staple of fiction, especially crime fiction in the 80s and 90s. Moreover, it's often linked to history, personal or public, and the theme of inheritance, which is of course broadly important in British literature in the, throughout the 19th century. Tattoos contain more deliberate meaning than most scars. They could contain images, symbols, or text. They rendered the body particularly open to the scrutiny of and redefinition by others. One story that rings the changes on this theme is H. Ryder Haggard's Mr. Meeson's Will from 1888. In it, a young woman, Augusta, is shipwrecked on a desert island with a dying man who's financially injured her and she allows him to have his will tattooed on her shoulders by a sailor in cuttlefish ink in order to benefit his heir, another man for whom she has a regard. Marooned on the island, the dying Mr. Meeson yearns to write his will, and a sailor explains that he has tattooed his own name on his arm as the result of a bet. And so Augusta says, well, you, you know, Mr. Meeson could have the will tattooed on himself. And he says, well, I'm not going to be treated like a savage. But the sailor also says that won't work. He says, well, we could skin you with a sharp stone after you've died, but then we have no salt. I doubt you'd keep. If we set your hide in the sun, it would shrivel up. That's not going to work. So Augusta volunteers, and Bill works away on Augusta's upper back for three hours. And you can put up the slide with the quote. To make the will legal, uh, Mr. Meeson have, ha must have some part of the signing. So lots of hands and lots of signatures on Augusta's back. And at the end, she almost faints as well she might. And then after she's rescued, the adventure becomes courtroom dramedy. And you can go ahead and put the, put the image back up there. Um, she says, it's all very well to be tattooed upon a desert island. And you can see the image of her here sort of shrinking and all of these men looking at her. Um, and she says, it's all very well to be tattooed upon a desert island, not that that was very nice, but it's quite another thing to have to show the results in a London drawing room. But when Augusta objects, her friend says, uh, Lady Holmhurst says, will you be compounding a felony? You steal the will, that's felony. And if you don't show it to him, I suppose you compound it. And Augusta pleads that this is really ridiculous. How can I steal my own shoulders? It's impossible. The absurd conversation gestures toward the status of the testifying body that we see really frequently in criminology of the period. Once her body becomes legal evidence, she loses control over that evidence. Her original intention to be sure the will is entered into evidence is subverted now as she is accused of wishing to withhold that evidence. She cannot change her intention. Her body has fixed a prior intention as having the primary claim. If the body is a text, then can the body also be a subjectivity with the capacity to intend its meaning? On seeking legal counsel as to the validity of the will, the story's legatee is told the law stipulates that, quote, well, a will shall be in writing and tattooing is writing. It is, I admit, usual that the writing be done on paper or parchment, but I have no doubt that the young lady's skin, if carefully removed, would make excellent parchment. At, therefore, at present, therefore, it is parchment in its green stage. And this a kind of ghoulish joke about flaying, you know, gets repeated throughout, throughout the novel. Other jokes are made in the text about, quote, the need to file Miss Smithers in the registry. Uh, as Eustace, now the lady's suitor, quote, gasped as a vision of Augusta impaled upon an enormous bill guard rose before his eyes. You can't file a lady, it's impossible. 
So the sexual implications of the bill guard repeat the earlier images of piercing and penetration in the tattooing scene. In being inscribed with a legal document, Augusta has become a public woman. And repeatedly that point is driven home that the, the body as text is not private. Miss Smithers is the will, says one clerk. Another clerk dithers, how am I to inspect the document? Finally, they photograph Augusta, who notes that she cannot object as she, quote, seems to be public property now. Of course, documents and photographs are replicable. And shortly thereafter, she sees that the photographer has duplicated the photograph and sold it to the press, as well as in individual reprints. Quote, in Regent Street itself, the first thing she saw was a man doing a roaring trade in prints. The photograph was one of herself as she had been taken in the low dress in the registry. In court, again, please uh, look at the next slide. Um, though she blushes and becomes, uh, yes, there, thank you. Uh, though she blushes and becomes tearful, she is examined under a magnifying glass by the judge and also had to, quote, walk slowly along the ranks, stopping before every learned leader to be carefully examined, while hundreds of eager eyes in the background were fixed upon her unfortunate neck. This scene duplicates the earlier one in which Augusta is inscribed by several men, writers and fly readers, and the lady's feelings are subordinated to the text claims to be read. In Regent Street, that shopping mecca, everything is for sale. In becoming a document, she has become a commodity as well, the one in which she has no prior right of ownership. And so Haggard rings the changes on this theme. You know, there's an extended riff on whether she can testify about the writing of the will when she is the will, um, or whether she would have to first be skinned. <laughs> and the judge finally decides, no, she can testify because her skin is separable, even if it is not yet separated. Um, so uh, George Burchette, a tattoo artist, um, mentions Haggard's story in his memoirs and also mentioned that in two cases, he did in fact participate in tattooing wills. Most disturbingly, he cites the case of a woman who came to be tattooed with someone else's will as a condition of inheritance. Um, he couldn't read it, it was in a foreign script. So uh, he just says that after it was finished, she looked once, shuddered and fled. In Burchette's example, the inscription um, of the will also alienates the self, making of the woman's body part of the property of the dead. The story of this woman continues an earlier popular association with forcible tattooing on women's bodies. It took place among some Native American groups as well as India and the South Seas. And if you go back to the prior slide, you'll see Olive Oatman, um, who was taken by uh, who was taken by a Native American group um, as a girl and tattooed as one of the tribes members. And then when she returned um, to white society later, um, she uh, became an object of scrutiny because of her facial tattoos. Uh, and there were lots of retellings of this story, usually connected to rape fantasies, lots of sensational retellings, most of which were uh, completely fictional, but they had these sort of, you know, uh, occasional reference uh, that were more, um, more uh, founded in historical reality. Um, but of course, as we've seen, forcible tattooing was not only the practice or primarily the practice of exotic savages. Uh, Jordana Balkin writes about a case in Burma in which a native woman was forcibly tattooed across the face at the behest of an English functionary. And certainly British imperial administrators often participated in the existing indigenous practice of tattooing criminals. Uh, punitive tattooing in Britain itself continued to be legal until 1871. So one can place this story in a wider context of narratives, both Gothic and comic about the alienation of the body in the period. Uh, I'll give you one more literary example, a 1911 short story, The Background by Saki, Hector Hugh Monroe, uh, describes the fate of a man who in a moment of elation upon receiving a legacy overspends on a tattoo from a renowned Italian tattoo artist who then dies. He can't pay, and so he becomes the reluctant prisoner of Italy, first when he cannot pay the widow, and then the picture is declared a national treasure and repossessed by the Italian government. The picture is the fall of Icarus, and it's held to have far more value than the man who, quote, bore on his back the burden of the dead man's genius. As the work of art begins to live its own narrative of value, the protagonist, Deplis, the eponymous background, finds himself the hapless pawn in a dispute about the authenticity of the work. 
quote, a certain German art expert declared it to be a spurious Pincini, probably the work of some pupil. And it turns out that he was drugged during the process of putting the design in. So he actually can't testify either. This is a theme that pops up quite a bit. So as with Mr. Meeson's will, which must be interpreted by the courts, the expert reader of the body as text is more authoritative than the person bearing the tattoo. So depressed, Dipley falls in with anarchists and then the Italian authorities take him to the border to deport him for his politics. And then they repossess him as the canvas of the fall of Icarus. <laughs> and finally, another anarchist defaces the tattoo and frees Dipley. Uh, however, Saki finishes, uh, he's never able to regain his own identity. Quote, he nurses the illusion that he's one of the lost arms of the Venus de Milo and hopes that the French government will maybe be persuaded to buy him. On all other subjects, I believe he is tolerably sane. He develops a monomania. So this is funny, um, but the status of art as a form of property that is public and may belong to another person or to a community puts into question the claims of privacy and property in one's own person. And this discussion resides, however uneasily, within a longer continuity of debates around the right of the state in the body of paupers, for example, established in the Anatomy Act of 1832 in England. Uh, where paupers' bodies could be seized for the medical schools to, um, to dissect, or of slaves uh, in the early part of the century. And the continuing use of living and dead bodies of indigenous people from around the world as museum exhibits. And these issues are, of course, still with us. And if you go to the next slide, I hope, uh, next slide, there we go. Um, this is a, a, you know, a lively conversation now around the tattoos on the bodies of um, performers and particularly athletes. Um, so, you know, interesting conversations about the intellectual property rights around tattoos even today. Involuntarily making the body more readable than it might normally be. There was a kind of presumption of yielding ownership to the resulting spectacle and interpretation. So this brings me to Hardy. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see, there it is, you will see a Matthew Arnold quote. In 1869, Matthew Arnold divided Britons into, quote, the barbarians, the aristocracy, the Philistines, the rising middle class, and the populace. Though he some, found something to admire in all three, he still found the majority of all a kind of work in progress. The Philistines were narrow and money mad, the populace was still unformed, and the barbarians were anti-intellectual and disinclined to modernize. Amanda Anderson's Powers of Distance advances a foundational discussion of the anxiety that accompanied the Victorian view of cosmopolitanism in the mid-century, specifically that being a citizen of the world could lead to having no clear allegiances. Worldly sophistication could breed moral sophistry. For the remainder of the century, the tension between modernity and tradition and the longer durée of the modern and evolutionary history would be a fundamental opposition. Again, Jordana Balkin suggests that the metropolitan fashion for tattooing in the 1880s and the 1920s that we already, that I talked about earlier, was related to quote, an era of exceptional strain for the aristocracy and argues that the aristocracy was increasingly read in this period and perhaps even perceived itself as a kind of atavistic pre-modern class. But as we see in Matthew Arnold's quote, the association emerges even earlier. In 1869, Matthew Arnold considered the aristocratic concern for the exterior of the body and feats of physical, physical prowess were values identified with savage pre-modern states. And if you go to the second Arnold slide, uh, gives you a little bit of a sense of what that is, right? That the barbarians were a culture that, that the barbarians cultivated their exteriority and their bodies, but not their interiority. Um, so high spirits, but not a lot of introspection. Hardy's Allow to Say in 1881 is the tale of young English lovers caught between old and new ways. The novel prominently features a tattoo. Typical of Hardy symbols, it functions to invoke a series of oppositions. It is a sign of true identity, both biological and aspirational, and a fraud, of atavism and modernity. We're not ready for that slide yet. <laughs> We're not ready for that yet either. <laughs> of the desire for rootedness and of a cosmopolitan disregard of norms. The plot is briefly as follows. Distancy Castle, 
has recently passed out of the hands of its impoverished old Norman family and into the ownership of Paula Powers, the heiress of an engineering family. Caught between vague longings for aristocratic legitimacy and her own Puritan roots, between feudal notions and modern ones, and these are Hardy's terms, Paula hires a young architect, Somerset, to restore the castle to its medieval glory. He falls in love with her in the approved novelistic fashion. She seems inclined to reciprocate, but wait, the scion of the distancy name arrives. And with him, a mysterious young photographer also appears and uses fraud both to lead distancy to court Paula and unknown to distancy to blacken the reputation of Somerset. Dare is one of those nearly mythical figures that Hardy likes. His age and sex are uncertain. His age, it was impossible to say, Hardy says. His hair was parted in the middle in the fashion sometimes affected by the other sex. Somerset finds himself unable even to sketch Dare's features, and Dare is defined by his indeterminacy. When queried about his nationality, he never makes a positive response. I have lived mostly in India, Malta, Gibraltar, the Ionian Islands, and Canada. On another occasion, he's asked, I can never quite make out what you are, what your age is. Are you an Englishman, Frenchman, Indian, American, or what? He responds, I'm a citizen of the world. I owe no country patriotism and no king or queen obedience. A man whose country has no boundary is your only true gentleman. He's referred to repeatedly as a cosmopolite and more ambiguously a traveler, a term in this text that often suggests criminal irregularities. The only other traveler in the text is someone who's wanted for terrorism. Dare claims a positive identity as a citizen of the world, but offers in fact a good illustration of that aspect of cosmopolitanism that Amanda Anderson discusses. The anxiety that a citizen of the world might lack any specific loyalty or moral compass. But Dare has one strongly felt claim to an identity, a romantic but doubly illicit one to a bygone aristocratic past. On one of the occasions when Dare is pressed to name a birthplace, he dodges. It would be a fact worth the telling. The secret of my birth lies here. And Dare slapped his breast with his right hand. It is necessary that it should be recorded, should verification be required at a time of delirium, disease, or death. Well, we're not then told what's under his shirt. But later, as Dare urges Distancy to marry Paula to regain the castle, we discover that he's Distancy's illegitimate son. And he hopes for his father to regain the family seat. But Distancy does not care for the castle, and he speaks of his vow to remain true to Dare's dead mother, whom he should have married. In response, Dare, quote, threw open his shirt front and revealed tattooed on his breast the letters Distancy. The effort to signify by surface features is one Hardy repeatedly plays with multiplying likenesses, both true and counterfeit throughout the novel. Upon viewing the gallery of Distancy portraits in the, in the castle, Somerset calls into question their use as an index of resemblance. Quote, he wondered how many of the lofty foreheads and smiling lips of this pictorial pedigree could be credited as true reflections of their prototypes. Some were willfully false, no doubt, many more so by want of skill. Somerset felt that it required a profounder mind than his to disinter from the lumber of conventionality the liniments that really sat in the painter's presence. But we are told that the portraits tell one clear story of lineage, quote, of the distancies pure there ran through the collection, a mark by which they might surely have been recognized as members of one family, this feature being the upper part of the nose. Everyone had this special indent at this point in the face. When he meets the last daughter of the family, he immediately recognizes her by it, though it seems to have decayed. Quote, he saw the dinted nose of the distancies outlined. It was, so to speak, a defective reprint of that face for the nose tried hard to turn up and deal utter confusion to the family shape. So sure recognition, utter confusion, which is true. Hardy suggests that maybe one must be primed to recognize, to read that particular dint that is so distinctive and yet so defective as meaningful. These portraits continue to play a part throughout the novel in the recognition of family continuity. And you can go to the next text slide the impoverished Captain Distancy deliberately plays up his family resemblance for Paula. So his ancestor has this mole. Um, and I might remind you that actually in, um, in the forensic medicine books, they say moles are not very reliable. Tattoos and scars are much more reliable. It wasn't exactly on the same spot, but it works. It works for Paula. Um, he tries hard to imitate the portrait and even to quote, remain enclosed by the frame while covering the figure. 
But it's the portrait itself which is found wanting in verisimilitude. Quote, his modern complexion is what is wanted to perfect the image, at least for Paula's subjective gaze. Um, the mole's not in the same place, but again, for Paula, the existence of the mole is sufficient. And you can look at the next illustration, you can see the illustration from the original text. Standing right underneath his, uh, his ancestor there. Um, so although the family is supposed to be easily identified by the marks handed down, at the same time, Dare is never mistaken for a distancy. Although at one point, Paula and another character say, now Dare is something like Charlotte. And then Paula says, well, he's really more like one or the other of the old pictures, but I forget which. So the question of the individual's inalienable identity versus resemblances by type is a persistent one in the novel. Somerset, architect and connoisseur of patterns, dismisses Dare's resemblance to the distancies as accidental and according to type rather than an individual characteristic. He says, people's features fall naturally into groups and classes. To an observant person, they often repeat themselves, though to a careless eye, they seem infinite in their differences. But in this case, the observant son of a painter may be wrong about the origin of the similarity. Dare's own expertise is in photography, as I mentioned. He's hired by Paula to photograph the family portraits. Hardy's a little heavy handed. Although photography was used even in the mid century in collage and other altered forms, it was still often understood by the general public as an objective instrumental form of art, free of the conventions that Somerset uh, doubts in the portraits. Sun pictures, it was often said, could not lie. Of course they could, and they did, and many of Hardy's readers knew that. Um, but Dare specializes in exactly this kind of fraud, making photographs, quote, to represent people as they had never been. In the case of his campaign against Paula Souter, showing Somerset as publicly drunk. And we might think about our own vulnerability to Photoshop and deep fakes, even though we, we know all about them, or we're drawn in. The question of the reliability of direct vision strikes at the heart of debates about the legible body, just as the, rep the question of replicas and the continuity of family types is central to discussions of degeneracy and eugenics. Without their heredity, hereditary counsel, the distances seem to become, have become flawed replicas, ineffectual like the captain and his sister, or worse, mutations that perpetuate further copy errors like the actively maligned dare. Dare's childishness, which is also mistaken for advanced age, is like his tattoo, a conventional sign of atavism. But the tattoo also signifies his cosmopolitanism, his up-to-date wanderings abroad. Like the uncertain modernization of the castle to which Paula, a Philistine aspiring to be a barbarian, considers adding a Greek peristyle, although she hires Somerset to restore the castle as a medieval expert, Dare has acquired the marks of wider culture. However, the tattoo can't really establish his identity or provenance as he does not in fact come from anywhere, nor can it serve as a marker of experience as the mark doesn't memorialize his travels. It's aspirational. When Somerset remarks that Dare is, quote, a being of no age, no nationality, and no behavior, a rival architect responds that Dare is a complete negative, and then puns, well, he would be if he were not a maker of negatives. This negative distancy is both identical and a dark opposite. He's also a source of new and corrupt images. Like the photos he takes of the distancy family portraits, he's a copy of a copy of something already alienated. And like his own, quote, patented photographic process, his copies are unfaithful reproductions, as illegitimate as his own textual claim to distancy identity. The notion of lineage demands truth in reproduction. Hardly, slyly, hardy, slyly suggests that modernity perhaps demands less allegiance to authenticity and more pragmatic embrace of deviant citations. When Paula finally decides to marry Somerset, a local worker wonders what she'll do with her paintings. He says, well, why can't she hire a traveling chap to touch up the pictures into her own gaffers and gammers? Then they'd be worth some out to her. The Distancy family portraits could, in fact, be touched up rather easily. The proposition seems naive because the reader knows that the portraits are not worth money for their true likeness, but for what Somerset has called the lumber of conventionality, which prove their historic provenance. But the apparently absurd suggestion might be read as analogous to Paula's desire to reclaim the castle's medieval purity while marking it with her own supposedly Greek preferences. She herself hopes to give the pictures to the Distancy family who do not want them. Dare solves the problem. He creates negatives of them 
and then he sets the castle on fire and all the, the portraits within it. The traits of noble barbarity identified by Arnold come perilously close to what later writers would see as throwbacks to a more savage state. Lombroso understood atavism that something expressed both morally and behavior and physically in the phenotype. Such persons could be visually identified by traits such as large ears or long arms or a sloping forehead and so forth. Um, such throwbacks were also immoral, amoral, vainglorious, impulsive, and cruel. But there's an ambivalence in that identification with an aristocracy thought charming but amoral, beautiful but empty of the kind of refined mo modern subjectivity cultivated by the middle class novel reader, for example, whose constant practice of introspection would lead to, quote, the examined life. The novel flirts with the nostalgic glamour of this atavistic character, even if it must eventually turn against it, as Paula's, quote, Puritanism demands that she reject the distances once she knows of the forgeries. Paula and her lover decide on a fresh start, planning to let the gutted castle grather moss as a picturesque ruin and build a, quote, eclectic modern house nearby instead. You, Paula, will be yourself again and recover from the warp given to your mind by the medievalism of that place, says Somerset. The novel concludes, however, with Paula's rueful response, representing neither the senses and understanding nor the heart and imagination, but what a finished writer calls the imaginative reason. Very well, I'll keep straight on and we'll build a new house and show the modern spirit forevermore. But George, I wish my castle wasn't burnt and I wish you were a distancy. The finished writer here, by the way, is Matthew Arnold. As the portraits are set on fire, they appear to come to life. Quote, he in the armor who was so much like Captain Distancy seems to shake the plates of his mail with suppressed laughter. The lady with the three string pearl necklace to nod with satisfaction that this was a meet and glorious end. Like all these tricks of vision, Dare is not what he appears in the inscription on his surface. But like any good fiction, it reveals a deeper truth. Though no English gentleman, Dare is an unscrupulous adventurer and thus, paradoxically, the perfect era of an aristocracy coming to be seen as more cosmopolitan than national and atavistically living a life devoted to a skin deep display. Hardy then uses the tattoo in all of the ways suggested over the course of the century but doesn't settle on any of them as decisive. Identity, it seems, is always aspirational and subject to the interpretation of others. Thank you. I am going to ask Nancy Henry to um, start her video and we can have a chat of um, Q&A. Again, I will um, meet, let me, Nancy, let me put you on spotlight as well. <laughs> there we go. Um, and I remind everybody, you can type your questions in the chat or you can type them in Q&A, whichever you prefer. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Pamela. I'm, I'm delighted to see that we have audience members from around the world, and not only from around the country. Um, we have a first question. It's from uh, my colleague, Hillary Havens, and she asks, um, I was wondering if you could unpack a bit more this connection uh, between gender, tattooing, and violation or rape and consent during the 19th century? Right, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it really pops up a lot in the mid-century. There's lots of, like, like I said, there were sort of captivity narratives associated with it. But people seem to be quite fascinated with the idea of being tattooed against one's will. Um, and that continues through the end of the century. And people who are tattooed against their will are almost always women. Um, and often there's a kind of context, which you see in Haggard, where he's sort of like flirting with the sexual innuendo of being a public woman, uh, even though it's sort of in a comic register. So um, yeah, I think this also has to do with the idea of appropriation of the body being a particularly feminized thing that women's bodies are appropriated correctly within marriage or within families. And then there are incorrect appropriations and inscription is one of those appropriations. So um, scarring and tattooing. Um, fall into that category. Does that get at the question? 
oh, cultural appropriation is so common today. That's a um, good question. Um, I would yeah, say I, uh, Pamela, I don't think everyone can see it. So let me go ahead and read oh, the I'm question. Sorry. That's OK. Yeah. And then uh, um, cult uh, cultural appropriation is so common today. Um, was it common in the 19th century? On business trips to China, India, and Nepal, I tried to avoid tattoo designs that were of particular spiritual or religious significance. Right. Yeah, and of course, you know, um, cultural appropriation would not have been something people were trying to avoid in the 19th century in the same way. Um, I think that there was quite a lot of what we would call that, and some of it was um, a sort of genuine desire to be open to something new, that is to, um, to get a tattoo that would be meaningful in a culture that you wanted to create ties with or you know, even have a conversion experience to a more local religion. Um, and then there was a lot of um, you know, connoisseurship. So for example, a lot of these Japanese tattoos, which may or may not have had um, particular religious or secular meanings in Japan, were seen as simply beautiful objects. Um, and valuable in the same way that there was a huge craze for chinois, chinoiserie, which I can never say, and japonoiserie in, uh, in um, the mid to late Victorian period, people collected China with Japanese and Chinese patterns. And so the idea that you would have the artwork by this noted artist was another act of collection. Um, so would that count as cultural appropriation? It's kind of on the bubble, isn't it? Um, I think that that falls probably into a little bit different category than the um, than the use of a spiritual tattoo. Um, but it is also true that lots of Britons were uh, on the hunt for spiritual experiences and conversion experiences in other cultures. And they may have had a different relationship to those tattoos than someone who just thought, oh, this is cool, I'm gonna get that tattoo, even though it's meaningless to me as a, a spiritual symbol. And again, you know, um, pilgrim pilgrims to Jerusalem traditionally had been tattooed for thousands of years by families who specialized in that as a hereditary practice and who still practice that, that. And so a lot of Christians would make that pilgrimage as well um, and get the tattoo uh, as a Holy Land journey. So is that appropriation? I don't know. Uh, we have a, a general question, which is, how did you get interested in this topic? Okay, yeah. Um, I didn't start out thinking that this was going to be a project on tattoos. I started out thinking I wanted to know more about skin and what people talked about when they talked about skin. And uh, one of the things that people talk about is inscriptions and properties of the skin that are inherent, but that are sort of readable. Skin color, which is, gets typed as racial color, is one of those properties. But um, especially in the literature, there's a lively conversation around tattooing. And as I said, I think the Tishborn claimant kind of pushed it to the, to the fore because it was a widespread practice that people were not necessarily thinking and writing about all the time until then and until criminology really focuses on it. But um, so as I was looking around to see what people were talking about when they talked about inscribing skin, tattoos were all over the place, especially from the mid century onward. So. I followed, followed that lead. Uh, I was wondering whether the, the practice, the, the technology of, of doing the actual tattoo has changed much um, over time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, the first um, tattoos that um, Britons talk about, they talk about going to the South Seas where they're actually, um, they're pricked in with bone. Um, and they imitated that often with needles uh, and used things like cinnabar and shoe black and um, gunpowder and charcoal to make the markings. Um, but by the end of the century, you get, um, you get uh, electrolyzed or electrified needles so that they, this is somehow, and I, I cannot explain this process, <laughs> like you not understand this process. But so RJ Stevens says, you know, oh, it's practically painless. It goes in so quickly with the new electrified needles. Um, it's, it's almost pleasant. It's like a tickling sensation, which I do not believe for a minute. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but you also see um, people who write about their own experiences. And a couple of people wrote like little handbooks for aspiring tattoo artists that needles were very common. And I remember reading one of them saying, you know, really, um, you should clean your needles between uses because otherwise sometimes it gets very red and it, it mars the, the design and, you know, uh, it won't last as long. Um, and he says, and the needles will last longer too if you clean them afterwards. <laughs> Interesting. Um, someone has asked whether there was any connection between the materials that were used and a person's socioeconomic status. Hmm. I think very often you find, you know, sailors, schoolboys, prisoners um, are using materials that they're finding around. So very often using charcoal much more uh, and shoe black and so on, you know, um, cinnabar and colors, which tended to fade rather quickly were more likely to be done at nice tattoo studios. Um, there was a lot of discussion, you know, as I said, there was concern about whether tattoos could be effaced. And the red tattoos were often discussed in this way because cinnabar does tend to fade. And uh, they did find, however, that if you dissect the body after death, of course, you would find them in the lymph nodes, um, that you could still find evidence of tattooing, if not the shape of the tattoo, because you could find that pigment um, that had been drawn into the lymph nodes. Wow, oh, interesting. Um, great, okay, so Carolyn asks, uh, I'm fascinated by the opposition and intersection of skin testimony, scar, tattoo, and the testimony of a document, a will, a letter. Yeah. So the story of Mr. Meeson's will amazed me. I had always thought that the document took over the scar as evidence took over from the scar as evidence, but your talk has complicated this picture. Can you comment on the historical complications of text and picture? Um, Ooh, um, uh, these I, days, so many people get texts for their tattoos. What do you think is going on with that? <laughs> oh, wow, that's a lot, that's a lot. <laughs> well, I can say that there was a really lively discussion around the origins of writing in the mid 19th century and a lot of discussion around um, ideograms and pictographs and whether this was a you know primitive form of writing um, versus whether it was simply a different kind of writing. Um, some of those discussions uh, in the United States were around the Ohio mound builders and um, you know and fairly abstract symbolic pictograms um, that were found there. Um, and so people like even Havelock Ellis thought that the tattoo was a survival of that. And they thought of it as a way of expressing oneself before one had, one had um, you know, uh, abstract writing. Um, but there was a lot of, there were a lot of people challenging that even at the time. Um, remember also that in this period, you know, we talk about documents taking over images, you know, really fairly late in the century, there were still people who, could not read and could not write, and they would make an X, and then someone would witness that X. Um, fingerprints started as ways uh, in, in India um, to get people to think of their um, signing a document as being something that could identify them, um, you know, as opposed to signing it and then just saying, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about it, right, and then sort of vanishing. Um, they were told, you know, this fingerprint is unique to you and, and, you know, we have the proof of the document. So, yeah, so that's more of a riff than an answer. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, images and the body and writing, you know, have this kind of ongoing and complicated relationship to each other. That's my that's my best take on that right now. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. So um, Fanula writes um, that Hulda Friedrichs, uh, Friedrichs, the Pall Mall Gazette journalist, mm -hmm. mentions in an interview with a tattoo artist that cocaine was used as an anesthetic. Um, links with both criminality and aristocrats. Ooh, yeah, I would bet. I mean, when when I saw in. Um, in Saki's story that, quote, he had been under the influence of the customary narcotics, I assumed, you know, laudanum, opium, something along those lines. Um, but uh, of course, cocaine is topically deadening. Um, and it will also make you pretty happy, I guess. So, so yes, perhaps so. Uh, and especially in the 90s, cocaine was quite big and injectable cocaine was quite big, as we know, of course, from Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Um, 
Would that have been criminal at the time? I think that's a little bit more up for grabs. Uh, it would depend on what country you were in and the context probably. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. Okay, great. Um, so Caroline um, asks, uh, you've addressed in the past the skin through its flushing and blushing as being seen an, an expressive organ in the 19th century. Is there a sense during the period that the experience of foreign travel cannot be expressed in a natural way, that the experience marks you, that you cannot fully communicate it through your own skin? Ooh. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I would put it perhaps in a category of experiences that you can't read on the body, but that have a transformative effect on the person, um, on their being. So, yeah, I think that often in literature, the tattoo is linked with that idea that, you know, Johnny came back and he's different. Right? <laughs> Um, and it's a way to kind of um, metaphorically body that forth, but also it's linked to a common narrative of like, he went abroad, he had experiences, one of them was this tattoo, and that kind of marks that, that he went abroad, but also did he go native? Um, and that maybe gets at that earlier question about um, cultural appropriation. When is cultural appropriation actually personal transformation? Um, do you ever get to carry something away, especially something that changes your body without, do you get to control that uh, completely? Um, and the answer over and over again is no. <laughs> um, the way that gets expressed is you don't get to control the interpretation. But very often I think it, it marks the idea that people are coming back different um, and not better. Right. <laughs> right, that they've been contaminated by some kind of foreign ideas, as well as foreign aesthetics. Um, what were the most popular tattoos um, of the period? Do we know? I don't know, um, but I can tell you what I've seen, and I've looked at a lot of pieces of tattooed skin. So um, that may tell us more about what anatomists thought were attractive <laughs> than it tells us, you know, because it may just be that they didn't preserve, like, ugly or insignificant tattoos in the same way they were like, wow, look at this, you know, hot naked lady, I'm going to, I'm going to preserve that. So lots of pictures of, um, again, naked women, partially naked women, dancing women, lots of sexual sort of tattoos. Um, sometimes pictures that look like they might have been the portrait of a particular woman. Um, and that would often be, you know, a face uh, or head and shoulders. Um, lots of things related to profession. Um, so, you know, things that marked when you became a journeyman, that sort of thing. Important dates. Um, World War I, a lot of um, people would mark with a date the scar, um, like if they, you know, had a significant injury, it would be a date under the scar. Um, so, um, again, some kind of landscape scenes and so on, but often also decorative things like flower pots and so on. And, you know, I mentioned Gemma Angel, she has a fabulous piece on, um, she found several collections of uh, several pieces of skin that turned out to be from the same person. And uh, the tattoo artist in drawing um, a child, um, which at first she thought well, maybe that's his child, or maybe it's just they thought it was pretty, who knows. It turned out to be taken from um, an advertisement, which itself had been derived from a painting. So she actually managed to trace the provenance of it all the way back. Um, after World War I, people often got, um, you know, landmarks that have been destroyed, a uh, cathedral in Belgium, um, or favorite paintings, or places, memorials of places, and people, of course. Great. Um, if you don't mind asking, <laughs> uh, telling us, how did the anatomists preserve this stuff, and where? What is the archive of tattoos that you access? Ooh. Ooh, um, I've seen them at the Welcome. I've seen them in um, in Scotland at the Anatomy Museum in Scotland, which was originally built on uh, Charles Bell's collection, but is of course uh, significantly expanded. Um, there are a number of them in France, but they don't show them. The French are much more um, much more uh, protective of any kind of human remains mm -hmm. um, than the British are, and so they don't display them. Um, 
So there are a lot of them out there. There were a lot of sort of mid-century anatomical museums that were sort of acquired or that moved around. Um, the mode of preservation, and that is something, frankly, I know less about, although it is something that she has worked on. Um, these were, of course, almost always removed after death um, and then uh, tanned in the same way that you might tan an animal skin. Mm -hmm. um, but you carefully stretch it so that the skin wouldn't shrink because if it shrank, you couldn't see the tattoo anymore as, as Haggard seems to know. <laughs> um, and human skin is much, much thinner than most animal skin. It's, it's very fragile. So it's, it's fairly difficult. Um, sometimes you need to mount it on something to preserve it. Well, um, another question is how conversant were the British novelists with rules and attitudes toward tattooing from other countries? Mm. Uh, I can see how Arnold would reference the UK legal terms, but was there a more popular notion of tattooing that the novelists were accessing? Hmm. Well, I think, um, again, the Tishborne trial brought tattoos up in this context of identity and everyone was reading that. And then that becomes a common plot device um, but you see a lot of casual mentions of tattoos, um, you know, that, you know, you see someone and he's described and it's like, oh, and he has a little anchor on his arm, you know, that kind of thing. So there was an understanding that this was common and again, an association of it with sailors, even though what we're learning is that it was much more widespread. It wasn't just sailors. Um, by the end of the century, you have so much emphasis on atavism, you have Lombroso that it gets really mapped onto criminals in a different way. And I think that's because Lombroso was mostly studying criminals. And so he imagines that because he's looking at criminals and they have tattoos, that tattoos are criminal. It becomes a kind of circular process. Um, the Camorra had particular tattoos that were um, marks of membership. And people tended to be quite elaborately tattooed um, in those organizations. Um, so that becomes a kind of popular association later in the century. Yeah, I wonder if that carried over into the 20th century because- Oh, I'm sure it did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. certainly um, the, the resurgence of interest in tattoos is, is not something that we all grew up with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It sort of went back to, I mean, it's, it's waxed and waned. Um, you know, again, you have this sort of like interest in it in the pre-world, in, you know, the, the era up to and including World War I and then it kind of wanes after that. People get more conservative about those things. Right kind of comes back um, later. Um, so, yeah. Um, Josh asks, um, were there examples of removing tattoos from living people? Oh yeah, a lot of people tried to remove those tattoos. Sometimes they altered them. You know, someone would have, uh, you know, RJ Stevens talks about an actress who had her first fiance's uh, initials on her arm and then that relationship went south. And so she had to have them changed. And you said, you know, the, the second man never knew that those were not the original initials. So you could alter them, right? Um, but a lot of people tried to remove them. And, um, you know, they removed them with acid, they removed them by burning. Um, there were lots of techniques to try to get rid of your tattoos. The problem is that they usually left you with a scar. Um, even if they did manage to take the tattoo off, it was because they took the skin off. And so then you'd have a different kind of scar. Mm -hmm. So um, again, in the forensic uh, uh, textbooks, it would say, you know, you can usually find, you know, where the tattoo was and you can see the marks of the attempt to efface it. Mm -hmm. um, and then once again, there were certain uh, pigments that were more likely to, you know, fade over time like cinnabar. Um, and, and thus the interest in being able to find them in the postmortem. Very interesting. Um, Amy, um, I think I've seen all the questions. So oh, here's another one, sorry, um, from uh, Rosalind. Evidence of children or babies being tattooed? Huh. I haven't seen um, any evidence of that actually happening in Britain historically, although it may have, I have no idea. Um, there were children who certainly were tattooed and tattooed each other, but we're talking about 11 or 12 year olds who might tattoo each other, right? Um, that said, um, there were sometimes stories about um, children who were tattooed and then would discover again that they were the heir to some kind of fortune or that they were the long lost whatever who had been separated from their family. So that was used as a plot device at least a couple of times. 
uh, Tracked by a Tattoo by Fergus Hume, I think, and I might be misremembering, but I think that character is tattooed as a baby um, or a very young child and doesn't know what the tattoo means. He just knows he has this, this, this you know, inscription. I'm really wondering if this is one of those things I'm not going to see tattoos everywhere <laughs> in Victorian literature. You really do. You know, I was reading um, I was reading Daniel Deronda the other day, and and I had completely read right past this for years. I mean, I've read that novel a few times, and uh, at one point, the um, you know Deronda's mother, who has sort of run away from her Jewish identity her whole life, says, you know, oh, you know, people look at us. Uh, even if they can't see it in our face, they think it's something that like a tattooed on our skin under our clothes. Yeah, and I, you know, so that's early 70s. Yes. And just, you know, such an interesting use of that as a metaphor, which kind of, in, you know, implies a widespread sense of what tattoos are, right? And again, as a kind of identity that is uh, unavoidable uh, or unerasable. Yeah, and of course, George Eliot would have read a lot of these travelers accounts, you know, she was just uh, such an avid reader. Um, was there celebrity associated with certain tattoos, such as the captivity tattoo? Well, Olive Oatman certainly, you know, I suppose she was a kind of celebrity. I don't think she much wanted to be a celebrity. Um, there were also plenty of tattooed ladies in traveling shows, right? Mm -hmm. um, and many of them would claim to have received their tattoos as a result of, um, of being, you know, um, kidnapped. It, most of the time, it doesn't seem like that was true. It seems like these are women who got tattoos and then sort of, you know, capitalized on that, um, who were already performers of one sort or another. But that was fairly common. Um, so yes, there were people who made a kind of celebrity out of exhibiting their tattoos. And then of course you can go back to, you know, where we started with Joshua Reynolds painting of Omai, who was a kind of, you know, celebrity both because of his foreignness, but also specifically because of his tattoos. Hmm. Um, Amy, am I missing any, uh, any questions that you can see? I don't think so. I think I think we're good. It's just I think it's one of those topics that we, Pamela, we could keep you here for days. <laughs> but I think well, there's one in the chat actually left that I think is a really good one, and maybe we can end with that question. Or I'm sorry, in the Q and A, and maybe we can end with that. Question. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tori asks. Um, I have a lot of tattoos. And I think my generation is in that uh, pendulum swing where we are seeing a lot of really good tattoo artists and interest in tattoos and displaying art. This might be part of this zeitgeist, but I have had a lot of encounters with people inquiring about the story of the tattoo. That question always feels intrusive, but I'm wondering how these inquiries might overlap with your research here, um, or if there is an old expectation that tattoos might mean that there is supposed to be a story. Yes, <laughs> yes. And that is what we see really persistently that the tattoo, again, is assumed to be expressive of the bearer and that it's some kind of truth that the bearer is trying to tell. And also a kind of long history of thinking that the tattoo is an invitation to read, right? So that if you have a tattoo, um, you know, as, as the questioner points out, you know, people kind of feel like they're being invited to discuss it. And that may not, in fact, be the case at all. But, um, but people have that sort of assumption that you're putting a text out there, that you're inviting them to read it and to approach you about it. And you see that a little bit in Mr. Mason's will. Um, of course, it's a particular kind of text, but um, she doesn't want all of those eyes on her. But now she, she can't not have that. Um, and even after she, you know, gives her testimony and covers up and never has to show her back again, all those images are circulating. Um, so yeah, also that assumption that it must mean something, that you know what it means, that you intend it to mean something. Um, and I think often questioners want to be sure they're not getting it wrong, right? Um, and again, you know, my, my good friend Gemma, who works on these things and who has a background in anthropology and art, is very insistent that tattoos are not readable, that you can't make assumptions about what they mean. But the fact is, texts are gonna be read. Um, 
and you certainly see that. I mean, there was a um, there was a huge dust up not long ago in uh, Washington, where uh, a police officer who had been in the Navy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he had been a Navy SEAL, and there was a tradition of getting uh, tattoos in the SEALs that were actually kind of um, appropriated from the Third Reich. Um, and of course, we've all become a little bit more sensitized to a full range of symbols of white supremacy in recent years. And so he turns up in the police office in the police squad and says, "Well, that's not what this means at all. This is about, you know, the group of seals that I belong to. Um, it's not at all about white supremacy. And it's like you still wear Nazi symbols on your body." <laughs> So there was a big sort of back and forth about should he be fired? Should he be allowed to display his tattoos? What does it mean? And finally, I think he he decided voluntarily to um, go in and have them altered. Um, but, you know, symbols change meaning and sometimes they don't change meaning, but people's sensitivity to that meaning changes, people's ability to read them changes. Um, and so, uh, it was, it was another interesting question about, you know, sort of who owns that right to self-expressiveness and who owns the right to say, you know, this is what this tattoo means. It doesn't mean this other thing. When you represent the power of the state. Hmm. Um, great question, Tori, and, and, and everyone else. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for this fabulous talk. Thank you to Nancy Henry for hosting this, uh, this lecture. And Pamela, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. For those of you who are attending, thanks for coming. And I hope that um, you join us sometime. I'm getting feedback on my phone here. <laughs> um, I hope you join us soon for um, our next Distinguished Visiting Speaker Series. And that will be on March 29th. So thank you for coming. Hope to see you soon. Thank you all. And thanks, Amy, for managing my, my PowerPoint slides, which were all over the place. You did a, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> and thank you all for coming.